How you all doing today? Before I, before I leave you all, I'd like to take a moment to really connect with you all. So would you do me a favor? And at the count of three, would you all just share your name? Here we go. One, two, three. Got it. Thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you. I have, for the longest time, tried to understand the way my outside influences and the way teachers and students connect. And as a child, I'd never really understood who I was until I got to know what my interests were outside of school. And so for many years around high school, I developed an interest in the art of surfing. And I was so interested in trying to bring the art of oceanography into school. I also was a daredevil and I would often jump from cliffs in my sophomore and senior year. And I've always wanted to understand that. But it came at a cost. And there was a, a time in my life, right around fourth grade, where I realized that every image, every piece of information, came in a form of doodle for me. And so every piece of thought, every fact, everything that was coming that my teacher was engaging with was a picture. And I drew that out. Unfortunately, that wasn't incorporated into my academic or even my learning. And I often wonder in this digital age, as we're connected on our devices, to what extent you all are really incorporating your interests, your likes, into the classroom. And I wonder what that might look like to develop that relationship where your online engagements, the dilemmas, the complexities behind your issues are really embedded into learning. And you might be thinking, come on, Mr. Nunez, are you kidding me? Am I really going to tell my math teacher that my pants are too tight or that I really like that person? And for me, it took me a number of years to recognize that, but it took me one student to really understand that that connection is really helpful and it helps to develop learning. <clears throat> it's a preview. In 2006, Jenna, we'll call her, walked into my classroom. At five foot two, Jenna was well kept. She was at the top of her class. She came in, and we had a conversation. Hey, Jenna, how are you doing? Um, um, hi, hi, Mr. Nunez. Everything OK? I really realize that you're doing amazing in my classroom. Thank you very much. Is there something I can help you with? A slight pause. Um, uh, at this point, Jenna looked very disheveled, unlike herself. Well, um, I, 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 I do want to say something to you. Sure, Jenna, what is it? Well, w will you just promise not to tell anyone? Um, and can you just promise that you won't transfer me? out of the school. At 16 years old, Jenna disclosed that she was pregnant. I found the news very peculiar in a number of ways. As I mentioned, Jenna was at the top of her class. Jenna was also one of the more introverted students at the entire school. And so as a social studies teacher and as her academic mentor, it was then that I realized that we needed to support Jenna. And so with her consent, we informed the entire student body at the school. And you want to know what happened? Jenna and her popularity just skyrocketed. At the same time, Facebook announced that it was developing and it was allowing its platform use for all high school students. Again, this is back in 2005, 2006. You all might be wondering, what is Facebook, Mr. Nunez? The idea behind that a pregnancy announcement and Facebook platform might be not interrelated, I'm going to share with you what that looks like and how that was today. For the next six months, Jenna's pregnancy, photos, and imagery went viral. You might say her belly went viral. Every post, 
Every sensation was liked. Every onesie that was photographed, that was posted on a Facebook, was liked. Everyone wanted to be a part of Jenna's life, and everyone was supportive of her. There's something that happened, though. Six months into it, right around the time Jenna was scheduled to deliver her, her child, she sent a very cryptic message. She had been absent from the school for that entire week. And she wrote, Today's the day I share everything. Today's the day I share everything. I left school that early that afternoon and I rushed over to the hospital, went over to Kaiser, I asked the reception, is Jenna there? There was no Jenna. I thought maybe she's at a different hospital, maybe she's at General Hospital. So I zoomed past traffic, I look at the reception at General Hospital, hi, I'm here to see Jenna. There was no Jenna. Today's the day I share everything. And as I drove back to school that day, I was so upset. How could Jenna do this to me? I had her back. Why would she lie to me? What am I going to tell the rest of the students? And before I disclose what became of Jenna, I want to pause and I want to think about how digital distraction works in this phase. You see, there's something really unique about what we're all presumably on. This idea of being connected in this world comes at a cost. That we feel the pressure to consistently want to connect with others. Whether it's in the way we respond, whether it's in the way that we like. Social media platforms have been intentional about keeping your attention. You know that color red? It seems to be consistent with an emergency, right? Do I like the dog or do I like the chicken bone from that last post? You know, I worry about this, and this is where I, I feel that there's a connection being made. That night, I came back home and I got a phone call from Jenna. Uh, Mr. Nunez? Uh, Jenna, Jenna, is everything okay? Yeah, um, Mr. Nunez, can I talk to you? Yeah, Jenna, what's going on? Um, pro promise you won't say anything, anything to anyone. Jenna, is everything okay? How's the baby? Are you okay? Well, um, Mr. Nunez, and there's a slight pause. Jenna, is everything okay? Mr. Nunez, yes, I'm not pregnant. Uh, what? No, I, I, I was never pregnant. Before you question Jenna's mental state, I invite you to think about a counter narrative. I too like maybe some of you in this room, wanted to believe that Jenna was pregnant and wanted to feel like I was connected in her life. And in the process of doing that as a teacher, I realized that I missed the most obvious signs that were in front of me. I realized that that message, today I share everything, that's not a message that confirms pregnancy. Today I realize that I share everything. And I want to invite you, before we think and before we become judges of this, I want to invite you in a world that might be an alternative. What would it actually look like for us to think about and to pay attention and focus in on our senses and to apply them in a digital space? What would that look like? And I'm going to offer you some hints as we close. That this idea of wanting to connect with others and wanting to connect with our teachers is so relevant and so important in our lives because it helps us to learn. So I'm going to offer three examples and way we can do that. The very first is I encourage you all to find your voice. And I'm not saying how loud you are online. I'm saying to actually find your real voice. 
A number of studies at Common Sense Media suggested that our kids report that if they knew, if their parents, and I would argue if their educators knew what was really happening, they'd be a whole lot more worried that what stays online should be kept online. And I want to challenge that this morning by asking you, does your digital voice, does your digital identity really reflect who you really are? I want you to demand variety in the way in which lessons are taught. Jawan, one of my favorite former students, would say, I'm tired of your warm-up, Mr. Nunez. I want to let you know that I want to talk about what's actually happening in my real life. I don't want to talk about the kite runner and what impact it had in his life. I want to talk about how my life is the same as the characters in a book. And it took me a long time before I realized what a statement was. Demand variety and incorporate what it is that you're thinking about into your lessons. Amazing teacher in the Midwest had suggested that instead of text messaging, instead of actually a traditional form of an essay, she said, why don't I have my students text message a response in a form of an essay? They're already using text message, why not incorporate that? And so she's now developed in her variety of her classes the ability for her students to text message a five paragraph essay. Imagine a world that might look like that. Finally, I want you to leverage your tools. So we all know that TikTok is, is amazing. We all know that Instagram is a part of that. There is something else called humane design, which is how we leverage our tools to ensure that we are prioritizing what's good in your life. And I close with this. Mrs. McCoy, a number a Spanish teacher in the Midwest has decided to use TikTok in a way that you wouldn't think otherwise. Over the summer, her kids started using it, and she said, each and every one of my students is already on this device. Why don't I actually learn to use it? She's a Spanish teacher, and so that uh, new year, what she did is she decided to assign her students a TikTok video all in Spanish. And what she said is, if you're going to be using TikTok and you want the world to know about it, I want you to make a TikTok video in Spanish and send it to somebody in another country that primarily speaks Spanish. And you know what happened? Her kids got excited about it. Her kids started to understand learning. I close with this one last message for you all. Be curious about your space online and embrace what's in front of you. Thank you very much. I'll be back. I need a clicker.